It's hard to believe it's been nearly seven years since we were first introduced to the new era of the Wild of Zelda games, and almost a full decade since it was first teased to us. Along with Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom came a bunch of bosses for Link to face, some of which are completely new, and others of which are new appearances of old monsters in the franchise. And we've got all of the stories and lore behind each and every one of them nice and bundled up and explained away in this video. So whether you've seen my boss lore videos before and need a refresher, or this is the first time you're seeing them at all, Sit back, relax, and enjoy this one-stop shop of all of the lore behind every modern Zelda boss. Oh, and spoiler alert, obviously. A Zelda game without bosses is like a pizza with only cheese on it, which some people like, but where's the meat? Where's the olives? Where's the pineapple? Mamma mia! To start, let's cover the overworld bosses in the game, which admittedly count for like 107 of the 114 total bosses in Breath of the Wild, or a whopping 94%. The biggest number of overworld bosses comes from two types of giant monsters, the Hynex and the Stone Talus. Hynexes are actually recurring bosses in the Zelda franchise. You may recognize them from their previous iterations in A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, or A Link Between Worlds. In every appearance, they're always giant Cyclops-like enemies, although by far their biggest appearance size-wise has got to be in Breath of the Wild, where they appear to be, oh, at least 30 feet tall or so. Because Hynexes are present in other games just like Bacoblins or Moblins or Lizalfos or even Stalfos, it can be assumed that their origins are similar to any monster found across Hyrule, which either means that they're just a natural species of being that just so happens to be evil or that they were created by way of the Malice of Demise, which is a decently widely believed theory insinuating that all monsters across the world of Hyrule, or at least the organic ones, are made of Malice, which originated from Demise. Should this be the case, then Hynaxes are no different and have simply been created by Calamity Ganon. And just like most of the other enemies throughout the game, their connection to Ganon's fiendish power according to the compendium is what results in their differing colors according to their individual power levels. A couple Hynaxes are actually dead and come back to life as the skeletal versions called Stalnoxes, which is of course due to the influence of Ganon's power and most likely shares an explanation with all Stall enemies spanning the entire franchise. The bigger question is why Ganon doesn't just make all of his monsters immortal like the Stall monsters monsters. You'd think that would be a pretty big brain move. Who knows, maybe his evil power can only go so far. Moving on, the Stone Talus bosses are quite literally living rocks that, you know, try to commit murder upon seeing Link. Because they're made of solid rock, they're extremely durable and take very little damage unless you attack a certain spot. And this spot appears to be their exposed brain or maybe even a heart on their central body piece, which normally looks like an ore deposit and is pretty much the only feasible way to kill one of these rocky dudes. They also seem to operate like a hub where really they're little brain deposit is the actual stone talus itself, and everything else just kind of sticks on or hovers around forming arms and legs due to magic. This enables them to mix and match other stone types into their body, allowing them to literally hurl their gigantic stone arms weighing multiple tons through the air in order to crush your tiny human skull, then just suck some more rocks out of the ground to create a new arm like nothing ever happened, or make their entire bodies out of molten rock or even frozen rock. Now we could also just say that Ganon's power makes the stone talus monsters come to life, which is probably true either way, but there does appear to be some strange things going on with them and patterns that we can pick up on that would lead us to believe that there's more to this picture, with regards to how they work. For instance, stone taluses appear to grow and mature over time. This is evidenced by the little bitty baby stone taluses called pebblets that you find throughout the land, followed by the stone talus junior and stone talus senior bosses. It could be that stone taluses are really just little nuclei that grow as minerals settle around them, leading to them growing or maturing over time, which is how rocks are formed in real life, so this explanation would be fitting. But the biggest question about these rock dudes is, where did that little nucleus come from? Is it a creation of Ganon's because he was just feeling artistic one day when he saw a rock? For a more thorough theory, check out this one I did about the possibility of stone taluses actually coming from outer space. I'll link to it below, and be sure to bring your tin hat with you. With the Hynaxes and stone taluses out of the way, let's move on to the Molduga. This is the rarest kind of recurring boss in the game, and again, reanimates when Ganon's power surges under the light of a blood moon. So again, it could be assumed that Moldugas are simply creations of malice. On the other hand, creatures heavily resembling Moldugas can be seen throughout the franchise as well, like the Moldorms from Twilight Princess which also swim through the sand, or the Molgara boss from The Wind Waker, and yes, I will be doing a Wind Waker video soon, so stay tuned. However, I would like to present one other possible explanation that ties the malice theory into the wildlife of Breath of the Wild, and that would be that Moldugas could be malice-corrupted sand seals. It would make sense 
sense, given the corruption that Malice is known for and the fact that Moldugas have horizontal tails, unlike all of the other worm-like mole enemies spread throughout the franchise. But of course, this is just my theory. The biggest Molduga is the Moldu King that shows up in Breath of the Wild's DLC, but to be honest, that's probably just a bigger sand seal. Moving on to the last world boss in the game, which the wiki doesn't count as a boss, but I absolutely do, enter the wonderful, peace-loving Lionel. That's a joke, these things are allergic to peace. Lionels have once again had other appearances in the franchise, first appearing in the first game actually, which means that the centaur-like Lionel as a concept in Zelda actually predates the Bokoblin, which is one of Zelda's most common enemies. In my opinion, Lionels have essentially the exact same backstory slash possible explanations as the Hynexes do. They are also biological monsters that could have either just been abound in the land of Hyrule or created purely out of malice. One thing that's notable about them though is their intelligence, which is rather high for a monster. Their weapons are forged from metal like the Lizalfos. They can see through disguises, and they equip multiple different items like a bow and arrow and sword and shield or spear or a large beat stick. The fact that they do forge weapons and there are many of them leads many fans to believe that there could be camps or communities of Lionels that survive together and share resources, which would only make sense given that other enemies in the game do the same thing. We never come across a Lionel camp in game, but perhaps we'll see some of these groups in Tears of the Kingdom, as terrifying as that would be. With the world bosses out of the way, it's time to move on to the unique bosses of the game aside from the final boss Calamity Ganon, and unfortunately there are only two, one of which is locked behind DLC, so really there's only one in the base game. Yeah, Breath of the Wild definitely could have capitalized on having more unique bosses, but anyway, let's start with the one in the base game. The strong, the burly, the one, the only, Master Koga himself, top banana of the Yiga clan. The Yiga clan, as most fans know, are defectors of the Sheikah clan, and as such are the same race of human beings, and feature the same white hair and red eyes as proven by the ex Yiga man we meet in game, Dorian. The Yiga clan has sworn off their sibling Sheikah clan and everything they stand for, which includes the Hylian royal family and the Hylian deities. Because of this, they actually serve Ganon instead and are both trying to hasten his resurrection and scouring the land in search of the hero Link, just in case he happens to still be alive a hundred years later. This command is said to have been given directly from their leader and is so ingrained in their brains that they actually carry out their sworn duty even when their leader is taken out of the picture. Koga himself has been alive for over 100 years, according to the Age of Calamity, and apparently is the de facto leader of the Yiga and in spite of his lazy napping nature is actually the earner of the utmost respect from them due to his mastery of secret combat techniques. He claims that his techniques come from his father's mother's father, which could possibly insinuate that his bloodline has ruled the Yiga clan for several generations, since the secret combat techniques that earn him his respect didn't originate from him, and that's about all we know about Koga. Anyway, moving on to the next unique boss in the game, Monk Maz Koshia. Maz Koshia is one of the well over 100 Sheikah monks in the game present within the shrines that were built over 10,000 years ago. The monks themselves appear to have committed a process known as Sokushin Butsu, which is the real-life Buddhist art of self-mummification that almost 20 Japanese Shingon monks actually managed to do between the years of 1081 and 1903. However, even a mummified human body can only take so many millennia, and as such, all of the monks in Breath of the Wild dissolve into dust after their shrines are completed. Well, all except for one. Maz Koshia is much more involved with Link than any of the other shrine monks, where each of them designed their own respective shrines and normally welcome Link and congratulate him upon completing their shrines, Maz Koshia actually orchestrates and guides Link telepathically through the entire Champion's Ballad questline which takes place all over Hyrule. Once Link finishes the many, many steps to finding and completing the much larger final trial, Maz Koshia actually proves that these monks may have still been alive and that their voices weren't just echoes of the past or recordings, but that they were really talking to Link, and may have even been able to not only move a little, but move a lot. Maz Koshia actually stands up and straight up fights Link in what he refers to as the final trial within the final trial, which is probably one of the coolest moments in the game. It's unknown what Maz Koshia's relationship was to the other shrine monks, as in whether or not he was their leader or something, but he definitely was the greatest of them, and I personally like believing that the shrines and trials in general were all his idea, since he refers to his own as THE final trial. A neat little piece of gameplay and lore that connects the Sheikah and Yiga together would be the fact that you can drop a banana on the ground for Maz Koshia and he will, uh, do this. Similarly, you can drop a banana on the ground for a Yiga soldier and they will act the same. Now, like I said before, they really are of the same race, so this banana obsession seems to run in the family, if you will. Maz Koshia's fighting styles are also interesting and allude to some in-universe lore as well, such as his ability to summon the extremely similar spiky balls that Koga does, implying that Koga's super secret combat technique is actually a Sheikah one, and that Maz Koshia might even be related to Koga, since the technique apparently runs in Koga 
Koga's family. Plus, Koshia and Koga do actually sound pretty similar. Perhaps he even is Koga's father's mother's father. I mean, these Shika types do tend to live a long time. Maybe the bananas are the secret to long life. Anyway, Koshia can also duplicate himself, which is the exact same move that Impa can pull off in Age of Calamity, once again alluding to Shika combat prowess. Other than his moveset, trials, and potential relation to Koga though, there isn't much else to talk about regarding Monk Maz Koshia. So now, we'll move on and let his bones rest once and for all. The final boss slash bosses we're gonna cover in this video would be that of Calamity Ganon himself. Uh, I mean, itself, and all of its goons. For those who might be unfamiliar, Calamity Ganon is the latest iteration of Ganon, who originates from Ganondorf. More on him in my Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess and soon-to-be Windwalker boss videos, though. It is said that by the time of Breath of the Wild, Ganon had been defeated and resurrected time after time after time again, so much so that his eventual return is something that can be relied upon prophetically. But why is he able to come back over and over? Where did Calamity Ganon even come from? Great question, and the answer is, in my opinion, from Demise. Now buckle up, because I'm going to explain to you my personal theory on the origins of Calamity Ganon, and Ganon in general, which could differ from your own. You are, of course, free to believe whichever you want, but check this out. Demise's essence is sealed within the Master Sword. This much is a fact proven by the ending of Skyward Sword. However, before he fades away, he promises that an incarnation of his hatred will forever follow the bloodline of Hylia and the spirit of the hero, all the while laughing his ass off and kind of having a jolly good time. Ask yourself though, what's so funny about losing a battle to a teeny tiny little insignificant human whelp? It's not like he was able to perform some ritual in order to bring this curse of his into life. And no offense, but that's kind of poor storytelling if he's able to literally curse the universe as we know it by simply thinking it up in his brain moments before literally being eradicated from existence. This franchise is a big fan of rituals and grandeur happenings that precede major events or changes in story. So if Demise, who was so cocky that he would win 20 minutes ago, gets his ass handed to him and is then unable to perform a curse on Hylia, then why is he laughing? Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think Demise had already cursed the world with his malice. Think about it, he was sealed away in the giant imprisoned avocado form many years ago by Hylia herself, yet monsters still plague the surface of early era Hyrule, and these monsters just so happen to be created by malice. So clearly, Demise must have released his malice into the world before he was ever imprisoned, possibly back in the age where he and Hylia battled directly. And you know what Calamity Ganon is made of? Malice in its purest form. The culmination of all of Demise's hatred, unleashed upon the universe in order to be a scourge upon Hylia's bloodline, epitomized into the mindless, formless monster known as Calamity Ganon. But I hear you wondering aloud, but Bandit, how did Ganondorf turn into Ganon if Calamity Ganon comes from Malice, which is separate from Ganondorf? Well, I'll tell ya. It's because I believe that Calamity Ganon and regular Ganon are two different monsters. That's right, you heard me. Two different things. And for proof of this, let's look at the origin of Ganon canonically. He was created at this moment at the end of Ocarina of Time, when Ganondorf moments from death calls upon the power of the Triforce of Power to transform into a hideous, power-hungry pig beast, which is then killed by Link and is never seen again. But Bandit, I hear you wondering aloud once more, Ganon comes back in other games. Yes, yes he does. But as different Ganons each time. Except for the Ganon in the Link to the Past and Onward. In this timeline, he just remains the same walking on two legs version of Ganon since the Fallen timeline only happens if Ganon kills Link here at the end. But in Twilight Princess, Ganondorf once again transforms into a Ganon, referred to as Dark Beast Ganon, who is a four-legged version created via the power of the Twilight, and is then killed by Link and Midna, never to be seen again. In Wind Waker, since Ganondorf retained the Triforce of Power following his defeat at the hands of the Hero of Time, but since Ganon had been killed previously in Ocarina of Time, he instead infuses a giant freaky transforming puppet with his power and calls it Puppet Ganon. Now there are other appearances of Ganon in the Fallen timeline, but I won't take the time to go over each of them now. My point is that what if Ganon is the monster that Ganondorf creates when infused with a large external source of power, be it the Triforce, the Twilight, or Malice? See, it's my opinion that due to seeing Ganondorf's corpse spewing Malice from within in the Tears of the Kingdom trailers, Calamity Ganon is the culmination of Demise's leftover malice that has gotten a hold of Ganondorf and used his body over and over and over again over the countless millennia to create many different Calamity Ganons, some of which even took different forms. And what's more is that perhaps the malice appearing in Tears of the Kingdom right around the Ganondorf corpse is more tendril-like and thick and deeply red in color because it's bonded with Ganondorf's blood, which resulted in his drained appearance. Now, the other versions of Calamity Ganon called the Blight Ganons, which each take on the ability and moves of the champions they were responsible for killing 100 years ago are simply extensions of Calamity Ganon itself, since it's just made of Malice anyway, and we know that Malice can clearly split apart as much as it wants to across Hyrule, and can even create other monsters given that it has bodies
bodies to corrupt, and therefore create other Ganons should it have a body like Ganondorf's that's powerful enough to corrupt. And wouldn't you know it, we can't find the champions' bodies anywhere in the game, and their Blight Ganons each move just like they do. But for a much deeper dive into what I'm insinuating here, check out my video that I did on that exact topic linked below. A Zelda game without bosses is like biscuits without gravy, jam, or butter. My fellow southerners will get that one. Like yeah, you might have a super yummy biscuit that's all warm and fluffy, but without any toppings, where's the hearty flavor? The tangy fruitiness. The melty butter. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom fixed something that a lot of fans had a problem with in its predecessor, and that is the addition of new, unique bosses that serve to flavor up the biscuit that is the world of Hyrule. Now before we dive head first into the waters of explanation, we've got to cover a disclaimer to check for rocks, because if we- Okay, I'm done with these weird metaphors, for now. Basically, a couple disclaimers to get through. Some of the bosses in Tears of the Kingdom are in fact carryover bosses from Breath of the Wild, such as the Stone Taluses, Hynixes, or Lynels and as such will not be retouched in this video since their explanations carry over pretty seamlessly if you swap any time I mention Malice for Gloom. Right off the bat, we're going to tackle explaining the bosses that all have something in common, and that would be the majority of the bosses in the game that appear to be either creations of pure gloom or gloom-infused wildlife or remains of organic material such as the Gibdos, not unlike the bosses that were created out of Malice from Breath of the Wild. The bosses that fit this criteria would include the Gleox, Colgera, Maragia, Marbled Goma, the Mukturok, the Boss Bacoblin, the Queen Gibdo, and the Phantom Ganons. Obviously, the one thing the vast majority of monsters from both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom have in common is Ganon's Malice or Ganondorf's Gloom, respectively, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still details to be uncovered about each of these monsters. Boss Bacoblins, for instance, were not present in Breath of the Wild, yet are present in Tears of the Kingdom, implying heavily that the events of the upheaval are what led directly to their existence, which is to say that Link and Zelda waking Ganondorf up at the beginning of the game and releasing the full power of his gloom into the world is what directly led to the existence of not only the Bacoblins, but the Boss Bacoblins, which are literally just bigger variants of Bacoblins that swing bigger weapons as the result of being, you know, bigger. And bigger is better. Since they are bigger better, they're normally the leaders of their little Bacoblin gangs and lead the whole troop around in their little patrols, which is kind of cute, and wield the most powerful of the Boko weapons. And you know how in the last game everyone was scared whenever they encountered a Lionel? Well in this game that feeling is still there, but for the new powerful three-headed dragons called King Ghidorahs, I mean Gleox, which come in four varieties. Flame, Frost, Thunder, and King, which is a combination of all three. Tons of fun. These dragons are directly said to have only appeared after the upheaval, which again proves that they are creations of gloom that were released upon the world following Ganondorf's reawakening. Interestingly enough, this is not the only time the Gleok boss dragon has been seen in the series. Actually, a Gleok is an original enemy, with its first appearance being being in the first game, The Legend of Zelda, where it appears three times, as two, three, and four-headed versions of itself. They've appeared in some of the handheld Zelda titles since then, but their terrifying Tears of the Kingdom appearance is the first time we've seen the formidable beasties on a home console since the beginning of the series. And who knows why Ganondorf decided to make them. Maybe the original Gleox were also creations of that Ganon, meaning this is just a good old Ganondorf original monster design. Or maybe he was just a big fan of the original game, who knows. Kulgera is an interesting boss to encounter in the game because not only is it a huge flying ice monster that's powerful enough to plunge an entire region into a permanent blizzard, but it's also remarkably similar to an earlier boss in the franchise, the Molgera, in both its name and its design. Both monsters are large, flying, serpentine creatures that freely manipulate and travel through not only the air, but the elements they are bound to, with Kolgera's element being ice and Molgera's being sand. The other part that's interesting about Kolgera is its first appearance being inside the ominous wind temple, high above the Rito village. But that's another explanation for the upcoming Lore of the Dungeons video. Have I mentioned that you should be subscribed? Anyway, Kolgera's similarity to Molgera extends to the fact that even Molgera was a creation of Ganondorf's back in The Wind Waker. So once again, perhaps this monster design is either a Ganondorf original or a literal resurrection of the monster Molgera, although that's purely speculative. Kolgera and most of the other dungeon bosses in the game can all be encountered in multiple different places in the depths after being defeated in their corresponding dungeons, which means there are multiples of each, again proving 
their existence as pure creations of gloom. Moving on, the next gloom boss would be the Queen Gibdo, which is a terrifying combination of giant flying insect and the literal undead. Now, to my knowledge, there has never been a monster quite like this in the series before. We have faced giant insects before, and we've even faced giant undead before, but never a giant flying insect undead. That seems like ground that shouldn't have been crossed, but hey, here we are. The Queen Gibdo appears to simply be a giant super mutated moth Gibdo, which similarly to the Queen also fly with moth wings, and can aggressively spit at Link to hurt him. All of the Gibdo in Tears of the Kingdom, the Queen included, share the weakness to light that the re-deads from earlier games in the series also do, which heavily implies a connection between the two types of enemies, that connection being the dark, unholy reanimation of human corpses. The Queen can also produce large amounts of sand, enough to cover the entire Gerudo Desert region in a sand shroud whilst releasing the reanimated moth and regular Gibdos into the area to hunt the living. Creepy stuff. The tiny but mighty Mukturok, which was responsible for covering the entire Zora region in a goopy substance called Sludge, appears to really just be a glue mutated Octorok, which is quite blatantly proven by the fact that it drops Octo Balloons, Octorok Eyeballs, and even Octorok Tentacles when defeated in the depths. So that was pretty mucking simple. Moving on though, the next boss is the Marbled Rock Roast. I know the substance is technically just called Gloom Rock, but I want to call it Marbled Rock Roast. And Marbled Rock Roast is literally responsible for the following three bosses. Unibo, Maragia, and Marbled Goma. And yes, I do mean that Unibo from Breath of the Wild. Unibo was visited by the fake Princess Zelda that was really just a phantom Ganon in disguise and given a strange mask to wear that altered his personality and made him feed Marbled Rock Roasts to the citizens of Goron City, leading to all of them becoming gloom-fluenced as well. When he was under the influence, he did end up upgrading his wardrobe a bit and becoming a mob boss though, so I can't be too mad at him. Plus, he snaps out of it once Link beats the mask off of him. The Maragia is an interesting boss because it is clearly named to be a reference to Volvagia, which is the legendary fire dragon that once lived within Death Mountain and was defeated by the Hero of Time wielding the mighty Megaton Hammer. Maragia appears to literally be a living rock monster though, so there's not too much to explain here, without pure leaps of speculation. Like, if I were to say that it's possible that Maragia is literally the reincarnated spirit of Volvagia given rock form. I mean, its design is pretty draconic and serves to further solidify its references to the dragon Volvagia, who has been long dead at this point, so I would say why couldn't it be a possibility? The final monster that Marbled Rock Roast is responsible for creating would be the Marbled Goma, a huge, four-legged, one-eyed, spider-like monster encased in rock that can produce unlimited amounts of gloom rock, and right off the bat, veteran fans of the series will recognize the name Goma from several appearances of the other monsters and bosses, all named the same thing that makes several appearances across the franchise, always appearing as a one-eyed, arachnid-type monster. And, uh, perhaps it would be more accurate to say that the Marbled Goma is the one responsible for the Marbled Rock Roast. According to the compendium, the Marbled Goma is the one that spread Gloom Rock across the entire Elden region, meaning Gloom Rock is literally Marbled Goma's secretions. Delicious. Just like the other dungeon's bosses, Marbled Goma has callbacks to earlier bosses from the franchise, implying that either Ganondorf keeps his designs, or perhaps some monsters reincarnate alongside the Demon King and the spirit of the hero. Now there's a thought. The final Gloom creation boss to tackle before moving on would be the Gloom Spawns, also known as the Phantom Ganons. And strangely enough, I feel like their actual Phantom Ganon appearance is less terrifying than their Gloom Spawn appearance, especially when they start shrieking at you and the sky turns blood red. Now Phantom Ganons have been around in the franchise for some time, with the first appearance of the iconic foe being in Ocarina of Time and subsequently appearing in The Wind Waker, Four Swords Adventures, and Breath of the Wild as the Blight Ganons. In Tears of the Kingdom though, this Ganondorf had the bright idea of literally duplicating himself since he's such a good fighter and sending these duplicates out into the world with weaponry to seek Link out in order to, you know, make him not alive anymore. Interestingly, the compendium states that Phantom Ganons are made of Ganondorf's own flesh and blood, and since they are creations of gloom, this would therefore logically imply that Gloom can be described as the flesh and blood of the Demon King. And this would make sense given that the amount of the goopy substance known as Gloom leaking out of his body seems to directly correlate with his dry, dehydrated appearance. But more on that in the next video. Believe it or not, there were actually some bosses in Tears of the Kingdom that were not created by Ganondorf's Gloom. Well, four to be exact. The first would be the brand new wild monster species introduced in the game, the Froxes. These giant frog-like beasts 
beasties appear to be some sort of evolution of a frog that also somehow bonded with Zonite, which all frogs, including the little babies, drop upon defeat. Their Japanese name is Degugama, which is literally a corruption of the word Gama, which means frog. They are completely nocturnal and are shown to hate the light, actively attacking any sort of light bloom that Link places anywhere. And as such, they only live deep down in the dark of the depths, which means their history is likely tied to the history of the depths itself, which is tied to the history of the Zonai themselves. But for the time being, they appear to simply be natural wildlife that can grow quite massive and really likes to catch a quick meal by opening their gaping mouths and waiting for a little person to fall in. Be careful spelunking. Next, and speaking of the Zonai, we have the Flux Constructs, which are, well, giant Zonai constructs created out of multiple giant Zonai blocks which move around using a Zonai force that looks similar to Ultra Hand which is a Zonai ability. Seriously though, as a little side note, most things in Tears of the Kingdom that are mysterious can be explained by just saying the Zonai. It's possible they were created to assist in workloads by perhaps transporting mining efforts, but that seems rather unlikely to me since each and every flux construct is located on a circular battlefield, or a battlefield of some sort, with some literally being on their own little battlefield island. It appears to be quite obvious that these constructs were created purely for trial by combat, and if the theory that all sky islands were raised into the skies above for the purposes of preparing Link to face Ganondorf is to be believed, then therefore these constructs were created literally for Link, just like the other training constructs and constructs of all kinds in all the shrines. But on the other hand, if you believe the Sky Islands may have been up there for a while but obscured by the magical cloud barrier, it is then possible that they were created for other Zonai warriors to practice combat with, but that's neither here nor there. Ultimately, they are combat Zonai constructs that were created for the purpose of training a fighter and even have a very large weak spot. But speaking of which, that leads me to the next Zonai construct boss the Seized Construct, which is faced as the boss of the Spirit Temple. Now this one also has a pretty simple explanation. See, Raru's older sister Mineru was a tinkerer and an inventor. In fact, she and Zelda were somehow able to get the Sheikah warp functions working, well before any Sheikah constructions were present in the world, based solely off of information derived from the Sheikah slate, I mean the Pura Pad. So yeah, she's kind of an era-defining super genius. She was also very interested in researching the concept of bonding one's spirit with machinery, which she actually actually ended up doing by bonding herself within the Pura Pad and eventually awakening to talk to Link and get him to build a new crafter construct from within the construct factory. Why she decided to not talk to Link before this point and maybe brief him about some of the stuff that went down ages ago, who knows? But either way, the Seized Construct boss is a gloom-infected crafter construct that is exactly like the one Link assembles under the instruction of Mineru. Its possession by gloom is extremely similar to the way that the Sheikah constructs would be possessed by Malice in Breath of the Wild. The final non-gloom-created boss in Tears of the Kingdom would be Master Koga, top banana of the Yiga clan himself. Now, I know he appeared in Breath of the Wild and therefore has an explanation in my Breath of the Wild boss lore video, but he's a living character who actually has some stuff happen to him in between games that's worth mentioning. If you'll recall, upon being bested by Link in Breath of the Wild, he was pushed by himself down the Yiga Hole, which previously had left his fate unanswered. By now, of course, we know that this hole is really just a chasm that leads down into the depths, which Koga survived falling into somehow. Anyway, once down in the depths, he was able to somehow contact his other Yiga clan members and begin moving the operations down there, with the new name of the game being Ultra Hand, Zonite, and the Zonai Constructs. Koga's new plan in Tears of the Kingdom, before being beaten once again by Link, of course, is to build yet another crafter construct in order to beat Link and gain the attention of the Demon King, who I'm pretty sure doesn't even know that Koga exists. Ouch. His fate is once again left up to our imagination, since the last thing we see of him is his muscular body being blasted off by one million Zonai rockets of his own creation. But you know, somehow, I'm sure he still survived. You may have noticed there's one boss left in Tears of the Kingdom to talk about, and that would be the one, the only, Ganondorf Dragmire, also known as the Demon King himself. Also known as the Demon Dragon. But you see, there's actually not much solid evidence given to us in the game that would enable us to fully explain Ganondorf's actions in Tears of the Kingdom, which means... It it is time for a theory. So once again, make sure you're subscribed so you know when part 2 comes out. A Zelda game without bosses is like a vanilla milkshake. Like yeah, there are those who just like a good, classic, not very exciting vanilla milkshake, but on the other hand, people like me tend to prefer chocolate with whipped cream and caramel syrup drizzled on top.
As I briefly mentioned at the end of my last video, Ganondorf's appearance in Tears of the Kingdom is actually pretty shrouded in mystery, more so than, I think, a lot of fans were expecting since this was the grand return of the most iconic Zelda villain that we waited, oh, 17 years or so to see again. I'm not criticizing though, just making the statement that because his appearance here is less fleshed out than his previous iterations, we will be theorizing and speculating about his origins and true motivations. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let's cover what we do know about the Demon King from dialogue and cutscenes in-game. Long before the events of the game transpire, the Kingdom of Hyrule was founded by a Zonai named Raru and a Hylian named Sonya. In its infancy, the Kingdom of Hyrule had reached out to its surrounding kingdoms for the purposes of declaring peace and establishing agreements and trades or whatever it is that kingdoms do with one another. This is how Ganondorf, the king of the neighboring Gerudo tribe, is canonically introduced to the Hylian king and queen. As after several attempts to reach out to the Gerudo and being met with no response, Ganondorf finally decides to make an appearance and declare his intent to submit to the rule of the Hylian royal family. However, Ganondorf was in fact hiding his true intentions. We can see from a previous cutscene that Ganondorf had recently actually tried to overthrow the Kingdom of Hyrule by summoning an entire swarm of the dangerous desert-dwelling Molduga beasts, which were pretty easily defeated by Raru's super cool light beam. After his master evil plan blows up in his face, Ganondorf spots Raru, Sonya, and Zelda's Zonai secret stones from like a mile away using his own natural eyesight. Anyway, he then becomes rather obsessed with the Zonai and their secret stones, as we can see from this dialogue in the False Allegiance cutscene, literally bringing up the subject of the ancient Zonai out of nowhere and saying it's unfortunate that there are only two left in the world, Raru and his sister Minoru. Then he just kind of stares at him menacingly and leaves upon being dismissed. Sometime later, Ganondorf attempts to assassinate Sonya in an attempt to steal her Zonai secret stone by creating a fake Princess Zelda and asking to see the queen in private. However, the incredibly wise Queen and Princess Duo see right through this deceit and are able to stop the Gerudo Blade from reaching the Queen using Zelda's newfound recall ability. But once the puppet Princess disintegrates into thin air, the Queen and real Zelda are distracted, and Ganondorf uses this opportune moment to eliminate Sonya in a single strike from behind, catching her secret stone as she falls lifelessly to the ground. I would also like to point out that Ganondorf is not holding a weapon of any kind when this happens, which doesn't really make a difference, but I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that he literally punched a person dead with a single hit. Yikes. Anyway, with the secret stone in hand, all hell breaks loose, both in Hyrule and on Ganondorf's face. Yikes again. Once the stone bonds with its new master, it transforms him from his mortal Gerudo form into that of the immortal Demon King, also giving him the ability to produce endless amounts of gloom, which is a super powerful evil substance, powerful enough to create endless monsters, overpower Raru, and even shatter the legendary Master Sword. It also makes him look really cool. Before the Demon King is able to kill the other two royal Hylian members in front of him, Zelda warps all three away, leaving the Demon King to further enhance his new monster army and lead an all-out assault on the Kingdom of Hyrule and her allies, including his own country of the Gerudo. This prompts Zelda and Raru to summon five additional heroes as the Sages of Hyrule and empower them each with their own Zonai secret stones in an attempt to defeat the Demon King. Zelda, however, realizes that this all must have already happened in her original future timeline since Ganondorf ends up still being alive in the future. She then warns Raru that this might not go their way, and Raru responds by saying that he's just gonna Yay! do it anyway, and says that worst case scenario, that knight named Link will save the world, since Zelda had been hyping him up this entire time, which is actually really cute. Anyway, eventually they do face the Demon King in a 1 versus 7 fight, which he ends up winning pretty easily. Raru then decides to sacrifice his own life by absorbing the dark demon energy from Ganondorf, cleansing it through his body and expelling it as light, which won't kill the Demon King, but will keep him in stasis for a really, really long time. And just before before Ganondorf enters his long but temporary slumber, Raru declares boldly that Link, the knight wielding the Blade of Evil's Bane, will arrive one day to kill him once and for all. To which Ganondorf replies, A battle will be legendary! The remaining followers of Raru then built the famous Hyrule Castle atop the ceiling chamber in order to keep the seal on Ganondorf intact in a nice airtight container. But one day in the future, 100 years or so before the present day, a little event called the Calamity happened and weakened Hyrule Castle, 
which led to Ganondorf's power beginning to grow once again and Raru's body beginning to disintegrate into light as the gloom overpowered him. Eventually, this left his body very nearly used up by the time Zelda and Link stumble upon the Demon King's corpse in the present day. Once they enter the chamber, Raru's hand, either knowingly or conveniently, falls off of the body of Ganondorf, leading to Zelda picking up Raru's secret stone and the resurrection of the Demon King. The first thing he does is attack the pair with an enormous amount of gloom, which mummifies Link's entire arm and shatters the Master Sword. Ganondorf expresses the fact that he's disappointed with Link since Raru hyped him up so much and then lifts the damaged Hyrule Castle up into the air, popping the cork on his seal completely and enabling him to spread his groom <clears throat> and enabling him to spread his gloom into the world once again as he falls deep into a chasm. In addition to his monsters beginning to spread in greater and stronger numbers across the land, he also releases manifestations of himself called Phantom Ganons to seek out Link and attempt to assassinate him, with one Phantom Ganon becoming another puppet Zelda and traveling around messing things up, which Link spends the majority of his adventure fixing. Ganondorf does have a neat moment addressing Link directly when the hero faces the puppet Zelda in battle, feeling that Link was lucky to have survived his attack initially due to Raru's hand, but then realizing that Link actually is, you know, kind of a badass. He then attempts to do quadruple the gloom damage to Link, but Link's friends, the new sages with the powers of the handed down Zonai secret stones, are able to brush aside the gloom like it was nothing. Ganondorf then plays them an MP4 video of what he's going to do to the world when his power comes back fully, threatens them, then laughs and leaves, and the next time we see Ganondorf is when he's approached by Link in their first and final conflict. Long story short, Ganondorf rehydrates, threatens Link, fights a bit, gets beaten, transforms into the Demon King, threatens Link again, fights a bit more, and then gets beaten again. At this point, Ganondorf is so unwilling to let Link win that he decides to do the irreversible, to consume his Zonai secret stone and become a dragon of limitless evil demon dragon potential. Then he gets beaten again, but this time Link stabs the Zonai secret stone, destroying it and Ganondorf, and practically setting off a nuke in the process. And thus ends the life of the newest iteration of Ganondorf Dragmon. But now, let's try to explain the beginning of his life, the motivations behind his actions and hatred of the Kingdom of Hyrule that are lightly touched on in the game, if at all. And really quick, before we get to that, I just wanted to take a moment and mention my book, It's a Zelda Book, which I've been given the amazing and humbling opportunity to write a bit of. It would mean the world to me and the author if you would check it out and maybe even consider pre-ordering it, since there aren't that many Zelda books out on the market. It'll be coming out later this year, and I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Anyway, as I've said multiple times so far, there is isn't much to go off of regarding Ganondorf's intentions aside from evil man, evil plan. Because of this, we'll have to look at the details we are given with a magnifying glass and deduce what we can from there. And I'd like to point out that if any of these conclusions are contrary to what you might believe personally, you are more than welcome to think differently. That's the beauty of theorizing as a community. That being said though, I think that what we're going to talk about today might not only explain Ganondorf's intentions and appearance in Tears of the Kingdom, but also his other appearances across the franchise as well as an ancient Gerudo legend that has other otherwise remained unexplained for over 25 years. But first things first, one of the loudest hidden details about Ganondorf's appearance in Tears of the Kingdom would be the Gerudo shown behind him. And by that, I mean these two masked Gerudo women in particular. They make two appearances, once here on a Gerudo Highland mountain and once here in the Hyrule Throne Room, both times being the closest Gerudo women to appear right behind Ganondorf. These twin Gerudo women wear sashes that read Koume and Kotake, which for veterans of the franchise should immediately immediately sound familiar. This is not the first time we've seen twin Gerudo of the same names linked closely to Ganondorf. In fact, in Ocarina of Time, which was the first appearance of all three characters, Koume and Kotake are powerful Gerudo witches referred to as Ganondorf's surrogate mothers. They also have the ability to fuse together and form the big witch known as Twin Rova. We don't have any such text to prove a similar connection in Tears of the Kingdom, but if you'll notice, their skin is also green, unlike any of the other Gerudo but similar to one in particular. Ganondorf. Their shared odd green skin would imply a blood connection between them and only them, and is also a pattern shared by their original Ocarina of Time appearances. This connection makes sense, but it's the time placement of these cutscenes that makes the theorizing a bit difficult to place. Because see, if these cutscenes truly do take place at the beginning of the Kingdom of Hyrule according to its known existence, which would have taken place sometime before Ocarina of Time, then that would explain the Gerudo twins' youthful appearance. However, the Gerudo
Gerudo, twins included, all have pointed ears in the cutscenes, which as the very astute fans know, is a physical feature of the modern Gerudo, not the original Gerudo from back in Ocarina of Time, which is proven to us canonically by contrasting the appearances of the old and new Gerudo women and reading this segment from Creating a Champion, which states quite clearly that the ancient Gerudo had rounded ears. The theories given to explain their modern pointed ears are debatable, but what's not debatable is the fact that the original Gerudo did not look like Tears of the Kingdom's Kotake and Koume, or any of the Gerudo shown in the cutscenes for that matter, except for Ganondorf himself who does have rounded ears, but more on that in a bit. This hurts the placement of Tears of the Kingdom's founding of Hyrule being before Ocarina of Time and instead implies it is after. And thanks to an interview between Famitsu and Zelda series producer Eiji Onuma and Tears of the Kingdom director Hidemaro Fujibayashi that was made public recently, this idea actually seems more likely now since Fujibayashi directly states that Tears of the Kingdom's account of the founding of Hyrule could very well be more of a re-founding of Hyrule, stating that it's possible that it was destroyed once before. And this is actually huge because it means that Tears of the Kingdom's founding of Hyrule past is probably still more futuristic than anything we've seen on the timeline, since the Kingdom of Hyrule is still alive and active at the end of all three branches. Well, except for the adult timeline, within which the kingdom was in fact destroyed by a flood, and new Hyrule was founded somewhere else entirely, leaving the original kingdom of Hyrule open for a refounding which would make sense given the sea salt we find all over the place in the era of the wild, since it would have been flooded by an ocean, but hey, this isn't a timeline theory video, hi. I need a break from those. I brought it up though to make the point that it's probable, given Fujibayashi's insight and the pointed Gerudo ears in the cutscenes, that the founding of Hyrule shown here actually takes place after the current timeline, within which Ganondorf and Kotake and Koume have all been slain. However, there is one case on the existing Zelda timeline that showcases an interesting appearance of Twin Rova, and that would be their appearance in the Oracle games. These games do take place in the Downfall timeline, which according to most theories is a timeline that splits off of Ocarina of Time if that that Ganondorf is able to kill the Hero of Time at the end of the game, after transforming into Ganon. This would mean though that Twin Rova has been killed in the Downfall timeline. This implies that their presence after being killed in the Oracle games is actually therefore a reincarnation of the witches, with their entire plan being to resurrect their surrogate son, who is now Ganon. Which would also mean that calling them an incarnation of Demise's hatred is valid, and therefore gives credence to their evil intentions and connections to the rest of the lore of the franchise. So here's my theory for Tears of the Kingdom's Twin Rova and Ganondorf. What if Twin Rova has once again reincarnated or resurrected as they've been shown to be able to do in the Oracle games? And furthermore, what if Ganondorf as a whole has always been a creation of Twin Rova? Think about it, they're known as his surrogate mothers, but you know, biology and stuff does imply that he must have had a father, and one mother, but that doesn't make sense since he has two mothers unless he was created instead of born. But that would mean his mothers would have had to have been extremely powerful witches to pull off something like that. Oh wait, that's exactly what they are. And if we think about Ganondorf's existence this way, then not only do multiple Ganondorfs sporting green skin across the franchise make sense, but it also makes sense as to why the female exclusive race of the Gerudo would randomly give birth to one male king once every hundred years. That could just be the rate at which Twin Rova can create suitable male heirs. Each program from their creation to attempt to overthrow the kingdom of Hyrule. And since it's the same ritual creating the same being known as Ganondorf, he would also sport the same rounded ears. If it's true, this explains so many things. The ancient Gerudo legend of one male heir every hundred years, the multiple appearances of a Ganondorf throughout the franchise, and the appearance of Kotake and Koume in Tears of the Kingdom's cutscenes, which is otherwise completely random. All it requires is that one of Demise's cursed incarnations known as Twin Rova reincarnates once again after the end of the current timeline, which is very easy to believe. But that's just my theory. And like I said, you are free to believe this way or not, it's your prerogative. I am as always very interested in your thoughts though, so please feel free to leave a comment below detailing what you think, even if it's just to say hi or that you think I'm weird or something. It's okay, I can take it, maybe. And please consider leaving a like on this video if you enjoyed it, or at least my efforts into making it, and would like to put a smile on my face. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel to get notifications on tons of gaming lore explained in bite-sized, easy-to-understand pieces, and it also helps grow the channel, so that would be much appreciated. Huge thanks as always to my bandit crew who make my day every day, and are the reason this channel is still alive. That's all I've got for this one, so follow me on my socials to keep up to date, and I'll see you next time. This is Bandit, signing out. Peace! Thank you.